Well, good, uh, good day to everybody. It's uh, midday, so we're uh, on the cusp of morning and afternoon. Uh, wherever you are, and I believe there are many people joining this uh, particular wealth tax webinar, uh, you're very welcome. Uh, my name is Richard Calland. I am a partner of the Paternoster Group, which is the political risk, political economy advisory uh, consultancy that works in partnership with Citadel. Uh, I've talked to uh, you, many of you, uh, a few times in the past uh, with Lawson and I do. Um, but today, it's my pleasure to chair and facilitate a conversation about the politics and the policy considerations that are relevant to uh, questions of wealth and equality. Of course, this conversation uh, does not happen in isolation of the big global and local events that are unfolding. Uh, and one of the things that the pandemic has done, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has done, is to once again highlight the extreme levels of inequality, both in South Africa uh, and around the world. Now, this is a conversation that has been growing over recent years. Thomas Piketty, the French economist's book, a couple of years ago, uh, acquired for him the status of celebrity global economist. Uh, but also put very much in the forefront of the public discourse, this question of the dangers and the risks and the harm that is done by systemic equality. Now, the tax regime is, of course, one of the main levers that governments have to address issues of equality. And that's why this issue, of course, is of great interest and importance to uh, all of us, I would suggest. Now, for this conversation today, I'm very pleased that we've managed to secure the uh, services, as it were, of Judge uh, Dennis uh, Davis. Um, and she uh, and he um, is a, a, an old uh, acquaintance of mine and friend, uh, and we work together at uh, UCT. Um, and he is uh, South Africa's, one of South Africa's, I would say, most eminent polymathic, if that's a word, I'm not sure it is, but he's a legal polymath of note in that he is an extraordinary uh, legal expert in a number of areas. Uh, he and I teach an LLM course in human rights law and constitutional law. In fact, by chance, our first class of the new semester and our new LLM class is at four o'clock today. And we've done that course together over the last few years. He's also uh, an expert in competition law, having been the judge president of the Competition Appeals Court uh, for several years, uh, and is also a labor lawyer of note, having also served on the labor uh, appeal uh, court. Um, but he's here today wearing his tax lawyer hat uh, because as well as being a scholar of note in the arena of tax law, he is also the chair of the Davis Tax Commission. And part of his role as the chair of that commission is to uh, speak at events like this, to explain what the commission is doing, how it's thinking and how it's approaching the very tough policy issues that confront the country. So. Uh, I'm very glad that Judge Dennis Davis could uh, join us. We're also joined by Hilary Dudley, um, who is the, uh, the Managing Director of uh, Citadel Fiduciary. Uh, I'm sure she's known to many of you. Um, now, the format for this uh, webinar will be as follows. Once these uh, brief introductory remarks are complete, I'm going to uh, facilitate a conversation with Judge Davis. And uh, Judge Davis, uh, in our preliminary conversation a few minutes ago, we all agreed that we would, in the interest of, of conversational atmosphere and uh, informality, uh, suspend our, our various titles. Uh, and with your permission, we'll refer to you as, as Dennis from now on, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to ask uh, four sets of questions to Dennis uh, over the following 25 minutes. I'm then going to uh, turn the floor to uh, Hillary uh, and ask her to respond. Uh, and again, I will facilitate that conversation for about 10 or so minutes. And that will leave us 15 or 20 minutes at the end of this one hour webinar in which questions can uh, be put by members of the audience. And as you were advised in your invitation, uh, the way to do that is through the question and answer chat function uh, on Zoom. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Uh, and if not, you'll be able to work it out very quickly. So you will pose questions to this panel uh, through that uh, function and I will try and uh, soak them up and then put them to uh, the two uh, panelists during that last part of the conversation. So without further ado, uh, once again, thank you all for joining this really important and timely uh, conversation. Uh, Dennis, uh, if I may uh, now turn to you. Um, as I said, I've got four uh, sets of questions that I want to put to you. The first is, because not everyone may know 
how the Commission works and what it is. I want to ask you just to explain what the role of the Davis Tax Commission is. Um, what exactly is that commission? How does it operate? How do you uh, exert your function? Um, how much influence do you have? Are your recommendations always accepted? Thank you, Dennis. Okay, Richard, thank, you, uh, thank, thank you very much for the generous introduction. Uh, my mother would have been very happy. Um, uh, can, and, 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 and welcome to everybody from my side. Um, we were appointed initially, we, we've transformed in terms of our function. So let me briefly, in a couple of minutes, just tell you. We, we, we were appointed by Praveen Gordon when he was the Minister of Finance. And um, I think the first time actually. And the idea was to look at tax policy. And we produced a whole lot of documents which are available on a thing called the Davis Tax Committee website, uh, which are available to anybody, uh, covering the full gamut of tax from corporate tax, to individual tax to base erosion and profit shifting, estate duty, VAT, etc. Come back to any of those if anybody wants to ask about them. And then um, we've had the most unique experience because I don't think any commission in the world in South Africa has served un uh, in the world has served under as many ministers of finance as we have, because we started all with Pravin Gordon, then we got Nene, then we got uh, um, uh, for a weekend. You may remember we had the weekend special, as he became known. We've even forgotten what his name was, and then, and then we had uh, Pravin Gordon back. Then we had Tigaba, and now we've got a uh, Tito Mweni. So, uh, in a sense, I suppose that's very much reflective of the great difficulty of any commission and any form of coherent policy. That if you keep on changing ministers, how on earth do you give the kind of advice that you're talking about? But initially, as I say, Richard, the advice was policy advice. Um, it then, um, we then got into serious trouble um, with Mr. Moyani when he was the uh, commissioner of Inland Revenue uh, to the extent that he, he took great exception at the work we were doing and as a result of which uh, he wouldn't cooperate with us. And in a sense, um, we were sort of caught in the crossfires between him and Minister Gordon. And at the end of the day, it became almost impossible to do any tax policy work because you couldn't get any information out of SARS. Kind of long story short, when uh, Minister, uh, when Ms., uh, um, Minister Mweni came in and the new dispensation came in, we were resurrected. But our role suddenly changed to look at the tax gap. And that's why I've given you the history. And the tax gap is effectively to try to ascertain how much we should be collecting and how much we are collecting. And to just give you a heads up on that, we think that's, and it's not accurate, but we think in terms of the investigations that we've done, that the tax gap is over 200 billion a year. Now, if you consider just for a moment, since everybody's sitting here is particularly interested in the South African economy, that the hemorrhaging of tax thanks to COVID-19 and everything else is around about 300 billion. You can understand the order of magnitude of what we're talking about. I can explicate that upon that later. So bluntly put, what we've been doing at the moment is um, basically digging through the information available to us. It's taken an incredible amount of time because SARS was so decapacitated under Moyani that they didn't have the ability to give us the information we required. Now we're starting to get information. The next few weeks, we will have a report out on the tax gap in relation to corporate tax and in relation to VAT. That has allowed us to, in a sense, explore those particular areas. And we spend a lot of time dealing with that. To give you an instance, I have been spending a lot of time with banks, with the big banks at the moment, trying to explore a whole range of VAT scams, which have cost the fiscus probably close to 100 billion, and we spend time dealing with that. And then, uh, in addition to which, yes, we do have to talk about uh, issues of policy. So wealth tax, which I know is on the agenda for today, is one of the issues that's been vexing our minds. Do we have any influence with the minister? That's a very interesting and intriguing question. In polite company, I must be cautious in terms of my answer. Um, and the reason is it's extremely difficult to get hold of the minister. Although I noticed about four weeks ago at an APSA colloquium, when he was asked about tax, he said, don't ask me about tax, Judge Davis tells me what to do about tax, which I assumed meant that if everything goes wrong, I get blamed and everything goes right, he, he gets the credit, which I suppose is the problem um, that any tax committee has. So we have, have a parallel track, Richard, in relation to the question of um, 
if I could put it this way, tax policy, there are issues that we've got to deal with. But at the moment, um, now that the fire, you know, to be perfectly blunt, when the fire in your house is burning, you don't uh, call upon an architect to redesign the house. You try to put the fire out. And so what we're doing at the moment, to be blunt with you, is spending most of our energy on dealing with the questions of the tax gap. And if I can just make one final point, one of the issues that is emerging for us, and there may be people even in this room who know about this because it's not private. I have been engaging now on behalf of our committee with Business South Africa, to whom I really want to pay an extraordinarily debt of gratitude and the accounting profession et al. Uh, the idea being to staff a unit uh, which will be uh, properly capacitated, hopefully with the sort of people just about to retire as tax experts, forensic accountants and, uh, and bankers who understand finance and which will essentially be designated to actually be the unit. Um, and I foresee myself playing a role in that as well, uh, which would then be a unit designated to actually deal with all manner of the tax gap, because quite clearly where we're leading is to an enforcement problem, which is the biggest problem we've got. So that's basically what we do. So Dennis, thank you very much. That, that's very clear. And I think it helps all of us understand uh, what you're focused on and your relationship with Treasury and uh, with the minister. And clearly, if one's concerned about a tax gap as large as the one you've just uh, enunciated, then one has to look imaginatively for new sources of revenue. And I suppose that's very much uh, part of your agenda, clearly, and it takes us to the agenda of this webinar, which is around wealth tax. Now, before I ask you about a wealth tax per se, I want to deal with the question of, as a second uh, question for you, the question of the inheritance tax as a specific form of wealth tax, because um, our colleague at UCT, Professor Pierre de Foss, uh, wrote an article, what, a couple of months ago, which as one of the more thoughtful uh, responses in the press to it from Stuart Theobald of Intelligex uh, came, uh, was, uh, he described it as de Foss poking a hornet's nest. And that certainly was a good description in terms of the reaction uh, in the Twitter sphere. Now, is this an idea that deserves consideration. Is it on your uh, table, on your agenda at the uh, tax committee, uh, or is it a no-go for various reasons? I'd be very uh, interested to hear your perspective on it, Dennis. Okay, uh, Richard, just to say one thing before we start, uh, when you spoke about new sources of revenue, the thing about the tax gap is to recoup the old sources of revenue. That's the problem. And, and so why that's a segue into what I'm going to talk about, about the estate duty or inheritance tax, is please understand that any of these taxes, whether it be inheritance tax or wealth tax, is no panacea. That is, you are not going to get anywhere near the sort of monies which are going to plug the gap, hence the importance of the, of the present hemorrhaging of tax, which is the greatest concern. In relation to the inheritance tax or estate duty, we have an existing estate duty. Um, we produced a comprehensive report on that estate duty, which essentially um, had a sort of partial response by um, the Treasury and the Minister some while back in relation to increasing the rate and giving people some breathing room. In a sense, what we were uh, on about at the time was a situation whereby we wanted to take middle class people out of the loop. Now, that means... Um, People in, uh, who'd say have anything three or four million rand, hardly a lot of money, um, and you'd want to allow them to be estate duty free. And the reason for that is that we worked out that if you simply were going to take all the money away, there are a whole host of people there in circumstances who really would be in seriously parlous situation and already a huge proportion of the tax burden that rests on them. So the idea was have a rebate of three, four million, can be what you like, choose what you like and then have a, a, a situation whereby you'd have a, a graduated estate duty, say 25% over a certain amount. And quite frankly, in more recent times, we've even been thinking of pushing it up to 50% over let's say 100 million or whatever the case may be. There's certain justification for that. It's been there since 19, the act that from 1955, we've always had an estate duty. It's never been taken seriously um, for reasons I cannot explain to you. 
uh, because we've got the instrumentality for it to this extent that any body dies, you have liquidation and distribution accounts and you would go through the master's office and it's much easier to implement an estate duty than it is an annual wealth tax to which we're going to come on. When I was on the Cats Commission of Inquiry many years ago, um, we estimated that an estate duty should, if you did it properly, collect on comparative evidence between one to one and a half percent of a tax base. To translate that into numbers uh, pre-COVID, that would mean something between 13 to 20 billion rand for an estate duty uh, situation. It hardly collects one or two billion at the moment maximum. I'm not suggesting it would get 20 billion, but it's certainly something which we think should be implemented immediately at a higher level. We say that for two reasons. One, the, uh, the efficacy argument, that is it's already there and there's no reason not to, to reconfigure it to make it more effective. Two, there is, I'm afraid to say, whether we like it or not, a massive legitimacy gap. You yourself have foreshadowed that when you spoke about the question of inequality in South Africa. You simply cannot have a tax system which in a sense allows for vast levels of wealth to be immune from any form of taxation. And probably from our point of view, looking at the literature, the inheritance tax is probably the best way. The forces example, the forces was, as I, and I, we've, been in the, we've been in the public domain, uh, we've written uh, as, a, as a tax committee uh, a response to the force. And um, unlike uh, Pierre, uh, as a lawyer, I'm somewhat, even though I'm eco uh, I have an economics um, honors degree, uh, I don't regard myself as an economist. So I had two fiscal economists who really are quite superb, Professor Woolard from Stellenbosch University, in my view, the best fiscal economist in the country, and, uh, and Dr. Ajam, uh, who, who's also excellent. And we pinned together a response to that, which is to the effect is number one, nowhere in the world you have um, levels of inheritance tax of the kind that he took in account. Number two, he's not taken account of the vast majority of middle-class people who really, um, in a sense, would be left in terrible positions. And number three, if you had the kind of tax that he had, you'd have such levels of abuse that it would be absolutely absurd. So we didn't think that that was particularly good. There's no international precedent for what he was talking about. But I know that he, as a provocation, he, he highlighted something which has annoyed me, which is the lackadaisical approach that the Treasury has had to what we thought were fairly constructive proposals in relation to an existing tax. So yes, your, my, my, the short answer to your question is, we should be thinking through uh, amending the inheritance tax. It's probably the best way to go. And for reasons that I suspect, you're gonna ask me about the wealth tax, you'll see why I say that even uh, after that, but I won't say more about wealth tax at the moment. Thank you, thank you, Dennis. So, so on the one hand, uh, DeFoss raising the inheritance tax is non-controversial because there's already inheritance tax in the form Correct. of estate tax. But the issues are, are about the level of that estate tax. Uh, and of course, what you describe as an enforcement problem or a, mm -hmm. a, a curious lackadaisical approach to uh, pulling that particular lever. Uh, but it does seem that uh, where he was more controversial, um, there's a huge gap between your approach uh, and what DeFoss was putting on the table because he was suggesting that the threshold uh, should be about a, a million rand and thereafter there should be a 100% tax whereas in fact in the proposals that were half accepted by the government a couple of years ago your proposal was that actually the threshold should be 15 million uh, rand and that uh, up until that figure there should be no estate duty but thereafter quite significant uh, increases of predation I think 30% uh, over yeah. 30 million uh, yes. And that, that figure was accepted, and that's the new estate yeah. duty. And we, we think it could be higher than that, yeah. It could be higher. Okay, yeah, so yes, let's, yes, let's, so that deals with inheritance tax, I think, very, very clearly. Let's move then to, I think, what is a more uh, relevant, actually, for the future policy arena, question of the, the wealth tax. Because the one point that uh, DeFoss uh, hung his argument on was the very important global point around how uh, wealth, power, and privilege relates to race. And of course, in South Africa, as much as in the United States, where the Black Lives Matter movement has, of course, gained momentum, that question is a generational one, a one of great political significance for obvious reasons related to apartheid. So does that not mean that the future tax regime of the country needs to take the question of wealth redistribution more seriously? And is wealth tax the way in which that will 
uh, take place, the way in which it will happen. Dennis. Now, there will be, of course, the answer to that um, uh, uh, in principle is yes. And indeed, the, the, the weird thing is, um, you know, there were citations of Piketty in regard to the idea of the inheritance tax. Of course, nobody ever bothers to read Piketty um, properly. They just sort of get the books and they're used as doorstops. Unfortunately, because they're so large, unfortunately, because I, I, like an idiot, when I was teaching at New York, actually prescribed Piketty, I've actually now had to tour my way through both these books. And if you go through them very carefully, particularly the second one, the new one, he actually is not very much in favor of inheritance tax. He is talking about forms of wealth tax. Now, and he does that for precisely the reasons that you've spoken of, right? The, the question of power and imbalance, uh, et cetera, and the fact that we're moving into levels of inequality now of a kind that are unprecedented. And he talks about it particularly because of the nature of wealth is often in intellectual property and, and problematic issues of that kind. Now, the question, therefore, that you've got to ask us of Richard in, in, in this regard is, one, do we need one? Um, and the answer would be yes. Why would we need one? because it goes back to the legitimacy question to which I referred earlier, and you probably write, um, probably to questions of power, although you'd have to have it at a level then, which would be so significant that one wonders whether in fact it would redress the kind of uh, relation, the coupling, or, uh, if you would uncouple questions of inequality and, and power imbalances. Um, so, so, um, uh, uh, um, we can have a debate about the principle of other, but I think in South Africa, you're absolutely right. You have to have something of that kind. Now, here's the problem. The problem in South Africa, uh, there's two problems in any inherit, in any wealth tax. Um, firstly, the base, and secondly, the rate. Now, the rate, generally, if you look comparatively of rates, we talk about one, two, maybe 3%. They're never much higher than that because because obviously you may have large levels of wealth, but you may not have the necessary liquidity to be able to pay it, and, and you don't want to create chaos in the market. So the rates never have been particularly high. You may want a slightly higher rate if you take the German example after World War II, where a form of wealth tax was implemented in a way almost like an RDP levy, um, which again wouldn't be a bad thing, say for one problem, that you cannot ever implement this successfully in the South African economy, given the levels and context of corruption in South Africa at present, which by the way, overarches everything we're talking about, but that's another, that's a separate question. So the, the first question is rate. The second is base. Now your problem with the base is you've got to have accurate information about people's wealth. You've got to be able, in order to implement a tax, if we were going to implement a wealth tax in South Africa today, we would have to have knowledge of people's assets and liabilities. Um, we'd have to understand exactly what's what in trusts, in companies, and in individual holdings. We have no such information. The levels of compliance in relation to assets statements um, in relation to tax returns is nothing short of disgraceful uh, or shameful, depending on which side of the spectrum you are. Um, we do not have enough information at all to be able to, to have a base which would be realistic. So, um, uh, and then secondly, contrary to a whole lot of research that's been done, there was one study that came out that said if we implemented a wealth tax, we could get 143 billion rand in. But of course, that conveniently forgot a number of things, that a lot of wealth is inextricably linked to pension funds. And you'd have to say, do you really want to have pension funds within the ambit of the act? And it didn't take into account a whole range of liabilities that you'd have to take account of in order to have a tax on net wealth. So the bottom line is that we are in no position at the moment to implement a wealth tax. Secondly, um, even if we were, you'd then have to have a, a SARS totally capable of being able to, in a sense, follow the money flows. And at the moment we know, I'll give you an example, we know of 3,467, and there are probably many more, um, um, people in, in South Africa uh, holding over um, something in the region of $100 million and more, right? right? So that's over a billion, well over a billion rand. 
Um, if you look at the tax tables, there are only 5,000 people who actually reflect taxable income of 5 million rand and more. <laughs> There's, you know, and as I always say, just go, just drive down Camps Bay, Bishop's Court, Santon, Bryanston, look at all the houses there and ask yourself, does this all stack up? So we've got a massive imbalance between information and reality. And until such time as we can actually um, implement uh, uh, an information gathering exercise, which is what we're trying to do, to ensure that um, this can, can, that we've got the requisite information and we've got the requisite capacity to ensure enforcement, there would be no point in having a wealth tax. So the answer is that's where we are. And let me make one final point. If people think that the wealth tax is going to plug the $200 billion, uh, sorry, rand gap, then they should think again. If we could squeeze 20 or 30 billion out of a wealth tax, that would be a remarkable achievement if you look at the comparative evidence of wealth taxes. And let me make one other point. Many, wealth, many countries now have given up on wealth taxes because of the difficulty of enforcement thereof. Uh, Dennis, thank you for answering that question with your uh, customary forthrightness and clarity. I think it'll be very useful for all the people on this call, this webinar, to hear what you have to say. Of course, given what you also said earlier about the relationship between your committee and the government, it, it's not a guarantee that the government won't move ahead with such a tax provision if politically it gains momentum, for example, within one faction uh, in the ANC. And I suppose that's something we might all have to uh, contend with. So that takes me to my last question, of which we've only really got a minute left, which is fine because you, you partly answered it in your opening remarks about the committee and its role. Uh, which was really to ask you about the broader uh, tax and fiscal uh, context at the moment. You, you've explained that the real problem is the gap and the fact that we need to recover lost sources of taxation, but also look for new ones. And if wealth tax is not a, a likely, in your view, um, new uh, source of revenue, is there a, another uh, option on the table that could viably be executed? Richard, just one f a quick, uh, 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 I'll a quick answer to that, but my earlier just response, the government can't implement a wealth tax. How are you going to implement it if you don't have the information? You can do it, but it's never going to, you know, uh, SARS will look at you and say, you're insane. You can't do it. It's not possible. So I, I honestly don't think it's on the agenda in that particular way until we've done the work. In relation to your second question, I don't, there aren't any other taxes that you can implement which are viably going to be plugging at 200, 300 billion rand a tax gap. You, you can't even increase taxes in this particular context because you're not. You're failing to get capital gains tax because of the nature of the economy. You're not going to be able to really raise corporate tax it, because you're going to get less anyway and it will be disaster to do so. And in relation to, um, to individuals, you can, if you wish, uh, increase the threshold from, say, 1.5 million rand up by three, four, five percent. But if you get 10 or 15 billion out of that, that will be a lot, given the fact that we've got that narrow pyramid of the tax base. So bluntly put, you've got to actually ensure the closing of the tax gap. If you consider, for example, just to give you one simple example, there's a secondhand gold scam that is doing the rounds. And I won't explain the details, happy to do so later. It costs Fiscus over the last three years, we think a minimum of 23 billion, right? a minimum. That's just one scam. If you, pick, you multiply those, that's where the money is. And that's where we have to go. That raises profound questions about our capacity to investigate, audit, and prosecute. And of course, the NPA and the state of it at the moment makes that even more difficult. But if you're gonna ask me, what's our solution to the problem? It lies in closing the tax gap, not in increasing taxes or finding miraculous taxes that don't exist. Dennis, thank you very, very much indeed for those answers to my uh, yes. questions. Please stay on the line. Uh, sure. I'm going to turn uh, the floor over to Hilary Dudley now uh, for 10 minutes or so, and then the uh, audience will have an opportunity. And members of the audience uh, out there, I can't see you, unfortunately such as the way of the world at the moment. But uh, submit, as I said earlier, your questions on the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen there. Uh, and then we on this side of the uh, fence, as it were, will handle your questions and we'll process them and then put them to 
Dennett and Hillary during the last 15 to 20 minutes of this webinar. Thank you. So let me turn to you now, uh, Hillary. Uh, of course, there's lots to, of meat to chew on in this conversation, isn't there? Uh, so my first question was uh, to you is, does, does what uh, Judge Davis, what Dennis has just told us, does that align with your own analysis of the kind of fiscal context and the advice that you've been giving clients uh, in your role at Citadel? Or is there something there that surprises you or shocks you or which you think deserves to be uh, confronted? Let me pass over to you, then, Hillary. Thank you very much also for your time. Thank you, Richard. I think um, for me, it's heartening to hear what Dennis has said around closing the tax gap rather than implementing new forms of tax, given the concerns that we've raised, um, having analysed the, the tax committee's reports around the efficacy of implementing new forms of tax as opposed to properly collecting existing forms of tax. Generally, in my experience, our client base, bearing in mind Citadel Fiduciary's role is to assist clients with estate planning and to deal with estate duty or inheritance tax and so on. Generally, in our experience, um, there's a lot of compliance in our client base um, and people are prepared to do what's necessary. I think for me, one of the things I would like to touch on is the question of corruption, which as Dennis said, is a much bigger issue um, than we can perhaps address today. Um, it's come to the fore this weekend and again with a statement made yesterday uh, by the ANC. The experience I've had when I've discussed this issue of wealth tax with clients, which we've done frequently in the past two years, is the concern around corruption and ensuring that tax collected is properly spent and that there's proper governance. So generally, the feedback is people are aware of the concerns around inequality and redistribution of wealth, but they need to know that the tax being paid is being applied to the people who need it most. And I think that's something we, we perhaps need to explore a little bit further. So you raise a very important, uh, it's kind of a philosophical uh, question for a democratic state, which is there has to be consent. And, and the core kind of consent uh, uh, issue where the, the rubber really hits the road is taxation. People will likely comply with the rules relating to taxation if they trust the government and if there is the, the kind of notion of consent is being adhered to. And what you're raising is a problem that the levels of corruption, the concern around the performance of government is, uh, it sounds to me as if you're saying your clients are becoming less inclined to pay tax or comply or pay more tax in that uh, context. Now, we're not going to, I think, fix that any time soon. Uh, SARS is clearly in the process of being uh, rebuilt. Um, so that's, that's a, a major issue, I think, that you've, you've tabled there. Um, what ideas would you have, uh, Hillary, if you were sitting in SARS or if you were a member of uh, Dennis Davis's tax committee, where would you be making proposals to actually help close this gap and, and kind of retrieve this very difficult fiscal situation the country has at the moment? Oh, Richard, that, that's a very difficult question. It's always easier to be sitting on the other side of the fence and, and, and <laughs> picking holes in other people's suggestions. But to me, I would agree with Dennis around the issue of enforcement and ensuring that people are compliant and, and that the back tax base is broadened. But I think hand in hand with that, it goes to the economy. And again, as Dennis said, I'm also not an economist. And I think we have to give a lot of cognizance to the fact um, that, that there needs to be a lot of work done to develop the economy, uh, to kickstart the economy. And in the current situation that we're in with COVID-19, we just seem to be going backwards. If I read the, the news reports around uh, the sin taxes, which haven't been collected as a result of the controversial bans on, on tobacco and alcohol sales, for example, but then the knock-on effect that that has had on uh, the informal sector and the formal sector, and also what I found interesting, a concern that uh, these kind of bans have driven a section of the economy that the government, government has tried to formalize to broaden the tax base has actually driven it back to uh, operate informally, thus shrinking the tax base again. So in a, in a 
in a sentence, I guess it's a very complex problem with so many elements that impact on this question. But again, going back to the basics, compliance and ensuring that existing taxes are properly implemented and collected would be the starting point. And um, I'm going to start drawing in some of the questions that are coming through on the, the, the Q&A line because I can see there's a growing number of them and we probably won't have time to answer all of them. So one of them uh, comes from uh, Charles Newman, in fact, and says, uh, if we were to increase VAT by one percentage point, how much tax revenue would that uh, generate? Um, Yolanda Naude uh, asks if uh, there's an opportunity to increase it to as much as 20% to plug this gap. Uh, what would your view of that be, Hillary? And Dennis, you may care to comment on this later if you'd like to. But Hillary, what's your thoughts on that? Richard, that seems a, a very good option from the point of view of uh, how easy it is to collect VAT and how broad the VAT paying tax base is. But that would also be subject to caveat that the basket of excluded goods is potentially expanded. Because again, you don't want to impact the lower end of the economic scale, people who are already uh, suffering economically, you don't want to penalize them further. So it might be a situation of having scaled or stepped VAT rates and VAT rates being higher on luxury goods, for example. Okay. And um, when you look at the governance system and that difficult question of enforcement, um, what do you think can be done to help contribute to strengthening that enforcement, those enforcement mechanisms from your vantage point? If one's looking at SARS, if one's looking at other parts of the system, what would be your thoughts on that? Richard, definitely SARS would be the starting point in ensuring there's uh, capacity at SARS and that service levels improve um, and, and that there's better communication with taxpayers and so on. Uh, would be a, a good place to start creating more capacity there. Very good. Hilary, thank you very much. Uh, again, please stay on the line. Uh, in the last 15 or 20 minutes now, I want to turn to the questions that are coming uh, through. Um, and Dennis, you're, uh, you're now back on, if I can draw you back into this, mm -hmm. this plenary part of the conversation. Um, would you like to comment on the VAT issue? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 roughly about 15 billion, Richard, uh, okay. percentage. But uh, please, bear, uh, Hillary's right. Of course, it has retrogressive effects at the lower end. And uh, I cannot for a moment think that this government would be implementing a further VAT increase in the light of what occurred when we, we moved from 14 to 15. In fact, many people at the time suggested then we should have gone from 14 to 16. One, you know, one sued because we would have got the 35 billion. But again, please bear in mind what that means. The numbers are important. 15 compared to a tax gap that I'm talking about. It, it's outrageous to suggest that we should be increasing taxes to facilitate further corruption and hemorrhaging. What we've got to do is, in fact, close that gap. I mean, we've got to ensure, I mean, you know, it just infuriates me that, it, uh, let me give you a simple example. Um, there's a famous story in SARS, if I just have a minute of time for this, uh, they call him Mr. Chips. Mr. Chips was a 70-year-old auditor who was sitting around uh, uh, having his coffee one morning and he read the newspaper <coughs> and he thought somebody had basically had a Ferrari. And he thought, that's very interesting. That's a very expensive vehicle. And to cut a long story short, he drew out the file and then started investigating. The man suggested that he came from his mother, but his mother was a pensioner. At the end of the day, having gone through that, the, very, the taxpayer sat across the table from the commissioner and signed out a check for 500 million rand of back taxes. That's what we're talking about. That's, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's what we're talking about. But that requires uh, capacity. You know, it's an overused that's word. Why I'm it saying. means human capacity. It means people with the forensic and other skills and, and the political will from the leadership of that uh, organization. So that's what go and after those I'm, taxes. And that's why I'm saying, Richard, if we could, uh, my, and by the way, the commission is bought into this. The two of us work very closely together. And by the way, let me make it absolutely clear that although SARS is not out of the woods, he's doing a damn good job in, in turning it around. It's mm. the one institution which was captured, which has turned around more than any other. 
And he and, and we, we are on the same page on this. If we could get 60, 100 people, there are people in SARS, perhaps 10, 15, 20, and you capacitate them with another 60, 70, divide them up into units, dealing with one, customs, two, VAT, three, high net worth individuals, four, corporate tax, and actually get them doing what Mr. Chips did, you won't need to increase that by, by 1% because you'll be able to do far more money, um, which is in the system already. So can I ask you this question then, Dennis? Is, is SARS short of money itself in terms of, of building that capacity you just yes. described that it yes. needs? Yes, SARS is short of money. And the commissioner will tell you, and he's right, that the only government department that makes money is SARS. And yet it's the one department that they won't give any money to. Right, so is, SARS is short. Is, is, there, is, is there any scope for, um, for private sector support for building capacity. I appreciate it's a very delicate topic. You can't privatize uh, those parts of the state, but maybe through a solidarity fund, you could. And, and I see a couple of questions coming from the audience are directed towards this. One question says, basically, uh, because of concerns about government and governance, could you not uh, ring fence a voluntary form of wealth tax to go into a, a trust fund or a solidarity fund to then be used and deployed on key kind of strategic levers. Yes, within, I, there's no the reason why you, there's no reason you couldn't. And there'd be no reason why we couldn't actually think through how we could capacitate the intellectual, I mean, the computer skills uh, uh, systems. I mean, SARS at one point when Gordon was the commissioner had sort of an IT system, which was, you know, a world beater. It totally was eviscerated under Moyani and it's going to cost a lot of money to get it back. There are, th those are sorts of initiatives that should be taken into account. But let me just say this, Business South Africa, when I asked them, when we had a long meeting chaired by Martin Kingston and a whole bunch of them, I want to give them incredible credit. When I said, look, this is what we need. We need people who can come in from the private sectors and be like, do uh, literally a national service for a year or two. Mm -hmm. People who are basically retired or right, retiring and they're quite happy to spend two years at SARS. It's, it's great for them. And uh, not a huge amount of money that, we, that they'd pay to the SARS. I can tell you the response was overwhelming. Now the ball is back on our court to actually get these people in and get the unit up and running to do exactly what you're talking about. I mean, interesting you should say that, Dennis, because my sense of, of people uh, in that space, retired professionals, having met many, in, including in uh, the many events at Citadel um, have held that I've spoken at over recent years, I sense that there are lots of people who would love to contribute to the national effort yes. in that kind yes. of way. Hilary, what do you think about that? Is that something that you think your clients would be willing to put their, either their personal time or their personal money towards building up that kind of capacity so that the job could really be done in an effective way? Absolutely, Richard. In the discussions I've had with people, almost to a person, there's a lot of goodwill and, and willingness to step in and serve and, and pass on skills. Um, so that would be a wonderful opportunity to, to contribute, as you say, almost to a kind of national service uh, and also to uh, perhaps mentor and develop those skills and ensure that that experience, the technical knowledge is not left when people retire. Well, I think this is a very important idea that we need to keep banging that drum until, until government listens to it. Um, I, there's been reticence from government in, in terms of tapping into that kind of retired, if I can call it, expertise. But I think it's now is the time to really press that idea. Uh, and, and Richard, do if it anybody... Through, through Dennis, you, Dennis, your committee, yes, yes, pushing yes, yes. the anybody, Treasury and so on. If, if anybody's got any ideas, if anybody's got people that they think would be ideal for this kind of unit, they can please get hold of me. I will take it extremely seriously, I promise. Well, thank you. I believe there are several hundred people on this webinar, and uh, I'm sure you've all heard what was just said. Uh, please don't hold back. This is, I think, the right time, the time, where uh, South Africa needs your expertise to try and uh, plug the gap through the human expertise that is needed to, to close the fiscal gap. So thank you for that conversation. Let me turn now to a couple of the other uh, questions. Uh, a couple here that are more technical, uh, at least to my mind. Uh, one is from uh, Richard Hawkins, which is, what is the view on the fact that there is a move to push the pension funds, insurance companies and asset managers to invest in infrastructure projects prescribed assets basically, in order to shore up the money base to deliver in these. Given that, what would be the consequences for pensions, if any? Dennis and then Hillary, both of you perhaps have a, an answer to that. Uh, well, I mean, of course, question. there's a whole idea about Regulation 28 being amended to allow for infrastructural um, 
um, investment. I think we've got to divide between two things here. I think that, that and I've done a lot of uh, interviewing of people on this particular topic. It seems to me a lot of people uh, have suggested to me that if the, I had a very productive conversation, for example, with Colin Coleman, who made a whole lot of very interesting suggestions about how the country could move forward in a lecture he gave at UCT. And I think a lot of these people are saying, if, for example, the investments were in serious infrastructural projects, which there's a proper return on, that's fine. But what you don't want is effectively exactly what is implicated in the question, which is that you start enforcing the kind of prohibited, the prescribed investment strategy, which then allows the government to carry gaily on uh, in, in, in its cavalier attitude towards corruption and the wastage of government expenditure. And so that raises the really profound question, how would you do this? And it does worry me, because if you're going to actually prescribe assets, certainly there's a lot of research done in the, in the 70s and the 80s, just that it really did curb the returns which pensions would have got, and that affects pension holders. So my view is we probably are going to need some of that money for infrastructural development. But then the question is, what is going to be the legal infrastructure in terms of which that is developed? And how do people guarantee that it requires, gets a return that doesn't compromise the pension, the, the pensioners? Mm. And that really worries me. I'm really anxious about that. Hilary, have you on that? Yeah, Richard, I would agree. Um, uh, particularly, you don't want to discourage people from saving for retirement. That, that is an issue, as mm. far as I understand it, in the country. Although there is a, a large pension pot, there's a large pot of retirement funds, um, one wouldn't want to discourage people from continuing to build that. Perhaps a, another question or, or a different angle to the question is something which the Davis Tax Committee alluded to in the Wealth Tax Report, which was looking at perhaps changing uh, the way in which pensions are taxed and removing some of the exemptions that pension funds enjoy from various forms of tax. That being said, uh, the report did make it very clear that that in itself is a very complex undertaking because again, for the majority of South Africans, the only savings they have is in their pension fund. They don't have discretionary investments and you wouldn't want to impose taxes that then again penalize people at the low end of the economic scale. Um, so again, that's perhaps something worth considering, but no easy answer. So very important I, uh, thought, if I may say so, Hilary, because South Africa has traditionally had very low levels of, of, of private yeah. savings, which is a real problem because of the shortage of capital for investment that that creates. So we, we clearly don't want to create further disincentives to saving. That is, would be an unintended, unwelcome uh, outcome. There's been at least one, I see I won't name the person, who has volunteered, is about to retire as a chartered accountant, uh, who would like to spend a few years working at SARS. Uh, we will pass on your details to you. Dennis Davis, uh, as uh, suggested. Uh, thank you for that. Golf is greatly overrated, so there are other things you can do with your retirement. <laughs> um, so uh, we're coming to an end. I, I, I was one or two other questions so I'm going to put in a moment, but a personal question here. You know, I'm very interested in the green economy. Uh, I know there is a carbon tax, Dennis, uh, which of course was very reluctantly introduced and finally introduced. Can you comment on whether you think it's been a success? And, and secondly, with, with this kind of historical moment that the world faces, humanity faces at the moment, where these, these uh, systemic frailties or fragilities are coming together, on the one hand, the one exposed by the pandemic. On the other, the one that's coming at us down the road at even greater uh, momentum and velocity, which is climate change. Uh, how can we uh, structure the future tax system in a way that increases revenue, and, but really does shift where capital is invested? Because one of the real problems is that too much capital is invested in the wrong things, most obviously coal and high carbon parts of the economy. This is a historical moment. We really need to reset the economy. Can the tax regime contribute? Well, uh, just uh, the first point about whether the carbon tax is success is the answer is probably the jury's out at best and probably uh, 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 and more negatively, no. You know, when we, um, when we were confronted with this, Richard, we thought it should be implemented at a zero rate so that you could actually test its efficacy across the, the country for it. To see how you could implement it and then you could ratchet it up thereafter. They didn't take our advice. Uh -huh. unfortunately. I think that what you said in relation to the broader issue 
well, has two parts to it. One, we need to re, re look at all the incentives. This is the tax policy part. The, all the incentives in the Tax uh, uh, Act, because you're dead right. You've got a whole lot of incentives that essentially were, were encrusted into the Act under different policy conditions, under different economic circumstances, all of many of which actually don't serve a purpose anymore. And so what you'd want to do, absolutely, is you can, in, in fact, change the incentive structure of the tax system. And there's no doubt that incentives actually do induce behavior to kind of promote the, 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 the objectives that you're talking about is promoting the green economy. But you know, as well as I know, that the first thing that this government should be doing um, at the moment is in a sense allowing the independent power producers as much possible latitude as they can, producing in a sense far more energy through the green economy. And you know what? There's significant money that we can raise at very cheap rates to do that. And even more than that, the economists tell you that we can produce 250,000 new jobs if we actually go the green economy route. So quite yes. honestly, all of this is part of it. The fact that this has not happened, the fact that it is absolutely rocket science, and not rocket scientists that we should do this, should enrage everybody. Because the fact that we can't have Eskom working properly, that we can't actually get growth because of lack of electricity, and that we're basically polluting the economy with the crazy policies we have, should have everybody out in the streets. It's, it, it, it's not outrageous that we haven't implemented this. So you did right. I mean, we could, we could implement tax incentives and we can essentially for, uh, fast forward the green economy development. Those things are things that should be number one on our agenda. Very good. I uh, had at least two more volunteers from the audience to join this Very national good. service. Uh, and I think we need to find a way of organizing this. One asked for an email address at SARS yeah. to write to. And I'll, I'll I don't think that's not you. the way to go. I think we need to structure this so that it doesn't fall into a wasteland. So I think, uh, Dennis, if we can implore you to help yeah, facilitate yeah. that, I think it needs to come yes, through you as a structured recommendation. Yes, yes, of course. Very good. And, and Citadel will uh, uh, remain in touch with you there. Uh, a last question then on the, uh, uh, just bringing us back to the wealth tax, the primary topic for today's webinar. Uh, Ross Deshaies asks, with regards to donations tax as a form of wealth tax, does this form of tax bring in a significant amount into the fiscus? Is it a worthwhile form of tax or does it just perform an anti-avoidance role? Dennis or Hillary? <laughs> Well, uh, uh, from my side, Richard, donations tax does not bring in a lot of money. Two, it's an anti-avoidance mechanism. It's not really a tax, um, which is a meaningful in its own way. It's coupled to an estate duty for obvious reasons, and also uh, because it, 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 it allows the revenue. If you didn't have it, you'd, you'd have easy abilities to just transfer all sorts of wealth and therefore avoid income tax. So it's mainly a, a, um, an avoidance mechanism. It doesn't bring in a lot of money. Hillary, do you, do you agree with that? I would agree, Richard, that's my experience. One thing that I haven't yet got a handle on is the impact of Section 7C and what kind of collections have uh, emanated from that. That new um, uh, section that was imposed, I think, three years ago now, that was where you pay deemed or tax on deemed donations to trusts where you have interest-free loans. Um, as far as I understand, SARS normally looks at things in a three-year cycle and we're heading up to that three-year anniversary and it would be interesting to see what tax has been collected by that mechanism. But again, um, from memory, as far as I'm aware, all of the capital transfer taxes, which includes estate duty, donations tax, transfer duty, account for about 1.4 percent of collections in total and so i doubt that even section 7c has has made a big dent there hillary i can just say this that we were trying to track that under the moyani era and we could not get any information out of them we're having to resurrect that whole idea of looking at the taxation of trusts and what the effect has been of 7c and the other amendments to section 7 for that particular purpose but at this stage no, nobody's got a clue. We, we, we're, trying to, we're trying to get a handle on that. Very good. Well, um, we've answered uh, the great majority of the questions that have come from the audience. Uh, I'm grateful for that. Thank you for the questions. And thank you, Dennis and Hilary, for your answers and for your expertise and your time uh, today. Uh, good luck, uh, Judge Davis, with your work in the committee. Uh, never has it been more important. Clearly, the fiscal crisis the country faces and uh, the medium-term budget policy statement, the so-called mini-budget, is just 10 weeks away. It'll be watched with even greater interest this year 
than normal, I think. Uh, and as one of the last comments says, all of this takes place within a, a governance and political context. And at the moment, the kind of cynicism that I think uh, many people feel is, is unfortunately largely justified. And until the government gets a handle on the kind of corruption and accountability and transparency problems that uh, uh, are being uh, faced, uh, I think this uh, discussion around the intricacies of policy, in a sense, is meaningless. <laughs> And so we have to bring the political economy into this. Right. So inevitably, I end on that uh, note because that's my uh, job uh, and the and the tar and the, the the role I play. But uh, I want to thank you both very much indeed. It's been a really enlightening uh, discussion. I think we all now are better uh, educated. I think we better understand what is on the table, what isn't on the table, and the real options that face uh, the the government as it moves forward on the revenue and tax side. So with those uh, closing remarks, let me thank everyone who has participated in this webinar and uh, our host Citadel for arranging it uh, and to wish you all a very good afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. So,